A very warm welcome to this week's um, teacher webinar on digital technologies. Um, uh, the presenters today are myself, Carsten Schulz, and uh, Nicola O'Brien. And we will mm -hmm. just ping back and forth quite organically in this webinar. So today, uh, today we continue with the turtle. Um, we do a bit of a revision of drawing and angles from last week. And we will introduce iteration loops. Uh, the overarching team theme for today is uh, Christmas in August. We didn't quite make it to Christmas in July. Uh, late for that, but it's still cold enough. We think uh, that we can uh, have a good excuse to draw and decorate a beautiful Christmas tree with the turtle. And as we do that, we're going to reflect a little bit on computational thinking and decomposition because this uh, example with the Christmas tree lends itself quite well um, for that. A bit of recap from last week is, um, and here you see some of our uh, turtle activities that we have in the Australian Computing Academy. So um, we, we write code that drives the turtle and um, we're using its position to navigate. For example, we've got little blocks there that would indicate um, move forward 10 steps and the like. We draw lines, we draw shapes, and we can turn the turtle, we can fill the shapes, we can change the thickness of the lines and so on and so forth. And so all that in combination lends itself quite well to drawing beautiful things. And um, the nice thing for the students is they get uh, wonderful visual feedback so if the code is doing something that is unexpected, you see the result. Um, it's, it's a very nice way of giving feedback to the students and they can then update and, and change their code. Talking about iteration. iteration. Um, from the Australian curriculum perspective, um, and that is code here taken from our unpacking section from the curriculum authors, uh, iteration involves the repeatedly running of a block of code until a condition is met. And um, students can implement loops in the programs um, either by doing something that repeats a given number of times uh, or until a certain condition is met. Uh, they can combine and include variables in that whole process. We are not going to refer to variables today. Um, and they can also uh, define conditions that uh, uh, cause an exit of the loop or a trigger. Um, commonly, um, we talk about loops. The official name in, name in the curriculum is iteration or also uh, repetition. So whether we talk about iteration, repetition or loops, from our perspective, that's all the same thing. Uh, most commonly, the loop term is being used. Um, and um, loops are very essential for the understanding of computational thinking. I get very excited when I uh, see loops um, because we have this step-by-step -step approach in, in coming up with a solution. And that's what I would say is quite unique in, in, in computing or in digital technologies. Good, my, my slides are jumping a little bit here. So in the curriculum, the um, iteration repetition loops, they fit in the five, six bands, one of the concepts there. And um, we start them with visual programming. And last week, um, Nicolas spoke about branching uh, decisions um, so that's a concept that builds, so uh, iteration is a concept that builds upon that what you heard last week. Good. Nicola, would you like to do the iteration activity? Thanks, Carsten. I'm happy to do that. Um, what we wanted to sort of emphasize and what we'll do a little bit with the students on Thursday is um, the loops in the world around us and that um, thinking in terms of looping computationally, it's nice for students to have tangible concrete examples around us. And we were brainstorming in the office and, and came up with some examples of loops. Um, uh, we wanted to find out from you and Again, with students on Thursday, we'll run this activity. What other examples of loops can we find around us? So have a go, Jason. Um, and it is an interesting point that we make decisions in our code before we repeat things. Um, I think that's because purely code with no input or decision making is limited in what it can achieve. Whereas um, even with a single, single piece of branching, Coding projects can grow in complexity quite quickly. So the build-up that we see 
in the curriculum is sequence first, then um, branching and inputs together, and then looping, which usually includes bringing in variables as well, which is a concept for upper primary years. Nicola, um, sorry, you cut out there for a moment, but isn't that the usual first step is we've got a bit of user input and then students make a decision mm -hmm. based on that user input. Uh, Correct. Color, yeah. value or something. So that's where the decisions start and the looping mm -hmm. comes in when we try to repeat things and, and optimize our code. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, shall we move on to the next slide, Carsten? I think... Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe here on this slide, one thing from the examples that we just collected in the office, in, in the virtual office, that is, is there are these different types of, of, of loops, and some of them make more sense than others. Like, for example, walk until you are in the kitchen is perhaps a better solution than do 30 mm -hmm. steps towards the kitchen. Because if you've got a very small house, um, well, you go walk past the kitchen, and if you've got a big house, you might not reach the kitchen. Okay, so walk until you are in the kitchen is a, is a solution that gets you to the kitchen. And and also we have these different terminologies. Sometimes we hear um, for, sometimes we hear do while or repeat until, um, and they're all different ways of expressing very similar things. Um, stirring the pot uh, until the jam is ready is also probably a better solution than stirring the pot or like 30 times because the jam might not be ready, but we'll come to that shortly. Nicola, back to you. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, here's an example of a loop and action in the code. And last week we worked with the students to create a project like the one you can see on the right of the screen where we build up our instructions one by one. Um, and that code's effective to do a job. So the code on the right, um, you can see that animation of the turtle drawing a triangle, and those six instructions will effectively draw a triangle. But it's not efficient, and as your shapes get more complex, um, you require more and more blocks, and there is a better way to do it. So with students, we work um, often infuriatingly to get them to make quite a long sequence of blocks to really create the need for a loop until they feel thoroughly frustrated, um, and then we'll introduce them to this repeat block. Um, with primary, obviously, with Blockly, you can see that it is this claw-shaped block, and whatever's inside the block is what's repeated. So we have an orange repeat three times, uh, with move forward 50 steps and turn left. And two code snippets you can see on the screen um, do exactly the same thing. Uh, one of them, obviously, with far less blocks, and wanting to teach this to students. Um, they might not be convinced if you throw them six blocks versus three blocks, but if you start to think of a shape with many sides or a more complex program, uh, the need for the loop block becomes apparent fairly quickly. So a challenge for you, and if we move on to the next slide, we have a snippet of code there on the left, um, and we'd like you to have a look. Is the better way to write that code, the top option, the second option, or the third option, which of the three options on the right will get the same output as the block of code on the left? I'll leave you a moment to have a look. Well done, Jason. Excellent. And you see Carsten was looking to see if everyone was looking closely. You'll notice on the left we have eight instructions, not six, as we had on the previous slide. But we actually had eight instructions there, so we have a need to repeat four times, not three times. Um, for a bonus point, Jason, what shape is that going to draw? You'll see we haven't changed the degree here. So even though we have uh, a four times repeat block, we're still in fact drawing a triangle. So. Now, when we made the slides, Nicola asked me, so why would anyone want to do that, like to draw that that and again, and the answer could be well, um, you might want to put another triangle um, side by side. So have a, a row of triangles, for example. Um, that could be one reason. Actually, that was just um, for me to make it a bit interesting and leading from the previous example. But yeah, there could be a practical case why you want to do that. Okay. So another question. This code here on the left, what do you think? Will it what will it produce? We've got the turtles being very active and hyperactive here on the side. Um, 
What do you think? I don't like what you've done with your slides, Carsten. They're looking good. <laughs> Animated chips. So uh, who would like to have a guess? Second option? Okay. So let's have a look. So we're moving forward and then we're moving right. Okay. So the difference between the first and the second option that in the first option, the turtle is moving forward and then left. And in the second, it's moving forward and then right. So mm -hmm. it says turn right, turn right. And then how often does it do that? One, two, three, four. So we should expect a square. And that's what the second option does. There's one line missing in the third option, and that's why it's not valid. So well done. It's the second option. And a nice way to do this with students is to, um, before you run the code, have students with pen and paper turn them into the turtle themselves and have a go. Um, you can either put the blocks up one by one or put them up together and ask the students to take on that role of the turtle and experiment and see if what they produce on pe with pen and paper is the same as the output when you run the code. So leading from that, the question is now which of these loops, these repeat blocks, is going to is the equivalent of that code on the left. Yeah, it was too easy. I should have shuffled that around, should I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Might be interesting for the students uh, on Thursday. Okay, right. Uh, let's continue. Actually, we might, but since we have a bit of time, Carsten, shall yeah. we go back a slide? Um, last week with students, we explored angles. Um, so if you go to the next slide with the repeat blocks mm -hmm. in the code, yeah. um, last week we explored angles and we floated the idea really, um, really lightly towards the end. We asked the kids to ponder the relationship between a square which has four sides with internal degrees of 90 degrees and then a triangle um, with three sides in terms of 120 degrees to see if they started to understand the relationship between the sum of the internal angles in a closed polygon. Um, this kind of code here is very nice for experimenting with students, particularly sort of older primary, uh, that they can start to play around with the turns of the degree and the number of repeats and see how this can be adapted really easily to draw any number of shapes. Um, then the next step, obviously, you could start to introduce a variable that would manage the repeats and the degrees. But it's a really nice starting point for exploring some geometry with students. And um, you can spend you know, a good amount of time just with a formulation of blocks like this, experimenting with all the different polygons and having and the kids will be quite, it's a nice intuitive way to learn about angles and sides and the relationship between those and a polygon. Mm. And, and um, I think what's, what's nice here with the repeat block is that if we want to scale that square, um, then there's only one place that we need to change, move forward 50 steps, right? We make it, for example, 100. Um, but then if we had the code on the left-hand side, there would be one, two, three, four places, four times in the move blocks where we need to change our code. Now, smart students might... Um, argue, well, if we had a variable where we set that value, um, we would get the same outcome and they are right. You know? um, but it is, again, an interesting case which we can put to the students why this code on the right-hand side is more efficient because it's actually easier to maintain. So um, on a very high level, we have kind of two types of loops in, in, um, in Blockly. Um, the first one is the count loops. Uh, I think we also refer to them as for loops in, in the last webinar. And they run for a fixed number of times, like this example here, repeat 10 times. Okay, mm -hmm. And we use these count loops when we exactly know how many number of repetitions we require when we write the code. Okay, Like in our case, if you want to draw a square, you always need four turns. You know that up front. Okay? But then there are also other cases where we don't know how many repetitions we need when we write the code. Um, like this example here, um, that's taken from a smart garden um, scenario where we want to automatically water our plants. Okay, And we need to measure the soil moisture. And only when it's below a certain value, we want to water the plants. Otherwise, our plants get too much water. Okay, Also not good for them. And these are the conditional loops. Um, and they're called conditional loops because they have a condition in there. In this case, soil moisture less than 20. Whatever 20 is in this case, it's 
some measurement, some value. Okay, but um, that is a loop that is a bit smarter, and it's a it's a loop that also makes our code more flexible. Usually, students start with these fixed um, count loops, and that's what what most um, uh, Blockly or Scratch implementations start them off with. Just do this ten times, do this five times, and that's fine. So you have a few examples to contemplate um, these kind of loops. So what would you say? Um, an air conditioner heating the room to a preset temperature, how would you implement that? Would you do a count loop or a conditional loop? That would be a conditional loop. Yeah, well done. Because we're, we're waiting for the temperature to reach the preset value. And based on that decision, we would then continue heating the room or not. Just looking at your question, Jason, um, about how you would introduce loops, I think um, they're really useful in a programming context. Um, if, if you're using Blockly, when you want to take some inputs and add them to something like a list. So we were working on a project with teachers last week, um, exploring making directions to get to school. And we'd ask a question, which was, um, which way should I go next? And as long as I didn't enter a space key, like a sort of a double space to say that I was at the end, um, it would keep asking would say, until I had an empty return, keep asking, which way should I go next? Um, and that's a nice context to start including these conditional loops. They're quite flexible. So you can think of all sorts of conditions like, well, my input doesn't equal I'm done. Or, you know, I was working on a problem earlier today that was set up with a conditional loop. And the question was, are we there yet? <laughs> and as long as the answer wasn't yes, I would keep asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Um, so, they certainly, you can introduce them quite early uh, in year five and six. It's a nice time. Every parent's favorite question in the car, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's, you never know how many times. It's, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's not a certain. <laughs> so what do you think? Like a school bell ringing for 30 seconds. It's a bit of a tri trick question because we put, we put a value in there. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think? Is that is that a count loop or a conditional loop? Good counter question. Um, and and Nicola and I, did, we debated it as well. Like loops usually run for on a count and you don't usually ring the bell for a second and then stop and then ring it for another second. Usually you ring it and it, at the same time you measure the time that's been uh, uh, expanded. And you would then say, okay, if if the time is like 30 seconds, or greater than 30 seconds, then you don't continue that. So we were actually thinking it's more a conditional loop than a count loop. But if you implemented your bell in a certain way, that it perhaps rings for a fixed period, like one second, then you could, if you have a bit of a time, a, a delay in there, you could also do it as a count loop. Mm. So it's yeah, such a clear an, scenario. It's quite an ambiguous example. Um, it reminds me, uh, in terms of conditional loops, Jason, another place, if you, uh, I missed at the beginning, sorry, if you're primary or secondary, but if you're working on um, game making with students, that's a really nice place to look at conditional loops too. So while health is greater than 100, you know, enable the jump feature, or while lives are greater than zero, play game, those kind of logics come up in games a lot. Um, and also, you know, I use Scratch a lot with students and you can build a timer, like a 30 second timer in a number of ways. You can have, you know, while elapsed time is less than, sorry, it's less than 30, or you can have, you know, wait one second inside and repeat 30 times. Each. So you can achieve the same result in a number of different ways in some of the coding platforms you might be using. We have another one. A teacher handing out a worksheet, sheet, a worksheet, not a worksheet, a worksheet, a worksheet <laughs> to twenty students. It's actually not one worksheet; it's twenty worksheets. No, um, what would that be? Conditional or count? Again, it could be a bit ambiguous. I would think it would be if I was writing the algorithm. It would be repeat twenty times, hand a worksheet to a student. Um, but another way you could do it if you knew that you could hand out worksheets until you have none left. Yes, could do that. It could be either way. Yeah. I guess it would depend what the next step was and what I was trying to achieve. It would be 
maybe some more context around it. So as, as Jason wrote, it could be conditional because when the student receives the worksheet, you would have to move on to the next student. So yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. I thought initially it's a, it's a, it's a count loop because 20 students, I can count that. Um, I'll yeah. walk to the different students. That's um, um, another possibility. So it depends how we look at that, isn't it? So, so the good news is that the count loops and the conditional loops um, are, are not living in separate worlds. We can use conditional loops in order to implement count loops. And, and here we have given an example. So in the block on the left, it's the classical count loop. We repeat something 10 times. And on the right, um, we can do the same thing with a repeat loop. We um, define a counter. We set it to zero, and then we repeat while the counter is less than 10. Then we do th something. In this case, we just print the counter. And after that, don't forget, never forget, to increase the counter by at least one in this case. Could be less than that, but it should be one. Um, because if you don't add that increase counter, you get something very famous, and Apple headquarters is there. At least it was until they moved, I believe. And that's the famous infinite loop, okay? A loop that doesn't stop. And you can do that very easily um, and very carelessly with the repeat while block. So, yeah. so uh, most coding environments, they will start students with account loops, and I think there's a good purpose. I think, Jason, coming back to your early question, you can move to these condition loops very quickly. Um, your students will probably say, why? Okay, why should I define a counter variable and why should I... Um, define that condition and then why should I increase it? Because that's what actually most programmers do. Uh, I think um, the repeat while loop is um, uh, or do while or so any conditional loops are very can be deflective, which means sometimes they're never called because if the condition is not met at the beginning, then condition then the loop the loop will not run and sometimes we want that in code. Um, so, so we think that um, students should be introduced to conditional uh, loops um, um, once they've mastered the count loops. I think the count loops are just conceptually much easier to get the students started and introduced to the whole concept that oh, something in the code is repeating. Um, I think that's an abstraction step already, moving from the just the sequence of blocks, as we saw earlier, to just having the block once and then repeating it like 10 times and then moving them over to the conditional loops. And that's what, so if the students have mastered the conditional loops, they can implement any loops with them. So it's, the, it's a pretty much general purpose block or concept. Nicola, anything I forgot on that? No, no, I guess I was just going to make the observation when you're working with students that often um, in your coding, like in particular if you use something like Turtle, you'll be using the repeat 10 times block a lot. Um, and when you try and transition to real life situations, they usually tend to be conditional loops. Um, so it's interesting to stretch everyone's minds a little bit and try and come up with examples of both. Yeah. But we, when we thought about it, we found very few examples where we do something just for a precise number of times. Usually it is based on some kind of condition and we do this until we stop. Um, most cooking is based on that. Okay, right. And I'm back here. Okay. So the benefits of, of loops, they make our code shorter and um, imagine drawing an Ecosagon, and we debated how to pronounce that, Nicola and I. So we call it Ecosagon. And I'm happy to be corrected that the pronunciation isn't right. But if you want to do this shape with 20 sides without a loop, oh dear, that's going to be it's going to be hard. It will take time, make mistakes and everything. And um, also what's very nice with these loops, they help to write flexible code, like code that reacts, for example, to user input or sensor input. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, water the plants while the soil is dry. So we can write very interesting programs when we have conditional loops. We shouldn't, we shouldn't um, forget to mention that you can put loops inside loops. And we will see this shortly with our tree challenge is that when you look at this code, we have a little repeat block here inside and that draws the triangle. And you see this here, fill with color, repeat three times, move forward 130 steps, and turn left 120 degrees. 
that draws one triangle. Very cool. It's a powerful tree. But then you can put that code again into another repeat block and do that a number of times. And then it, um, it draws um, more blocks. Okay. In, in that case, actually, it's more than three. I think we've seen five or so. Um, so um, once we start mastering the loops and we put loops inside loops, we can make very, very cool um, shapes with those. So here's a question. Um, I mentioned earlier we also reflect on computational thinking and decomposition a little bit. But what do you think? What are the things that we need to master in order to draw a tree with turtle? And what I mean tree is like a tree like the one you see in the picture here. What what do you say? What do we need to master? What are the steps, the building blocks? Angles? Yep, angles. We absolutely need to master angles. Direct. Yep. Loops, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the smallest thing that we need to to master? Maybe, maybe Jason, you refer to this as directions. Do you, did you mean like drawing a line? Yes. So we need to be able to draw a line. We need to be able to to turn the turtle and draw another line, and then turn the turtle again to draw another line. This way, we've done a triangle, and then we need to be able to put that, that code inside another loop in order to make the different segments of the of the tree. And uh, later we add a little bit of decoration to it, like the baubles or the star at the top. Um, and these can be made with other loops then, for example. Don't have to be, but they can be. And um, that's something we wanted to show you today. So what we do, this is our tree challenge. I'll just show you how you get there. So you go to uh, Grok Learning. Okay. And then here in the search field, just type in tree. And there it is. There's only one tree challenge, hooray, that makes it easy. Then just click on it, and then you get to where I am here. Okay, so that's a, that's a challenge that we originally made for Christmas. It was one of our Christmas specials, but then, as I said, Christmas in August is, is very topical now. And um, I want to play you the introduction. So there we are. Can you hear? Oh, can hear. Oh, where? Where? Okay, right. And what you could see here. For those of you with the experienced um, loop eye, is that we have loops inside loops inside loops in the extreme if we want to draw multiple trees. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have loops inside loops to make one tree, and then we can do that again inside another loop, and then we make multiple trees. So once students have understood that concept, there's actually no stopping them. There's no limitations. Okay, so we're introducing the, the turtle. So we start with making a triangle. Okay, we introduce students to making a triangle. And um, say, so, okay, what is the first step to draw a triangle? And we say, well, the first step really is to draw a line. Okay, so we introduce the students to the um, move block. Okay, so and play with that a little bit here. So um, you see here the turtle code and uh, Nicola showed some of our turtle challenge um, uh, last time. So I can just run this. Okay, make a short line. Um, I could, for example, make a longer line. Run this, I've got a longer line. Okay, good. So we introduced students to drawing a line. So far, nothing new because we've done that last week. And um, here again, we make a, a longer line, 50 in this case. So I was preempting a little bit what was coming next. Um, and then we combine moving and turning. All right. Moving and turning. And after that, we do moving and turning and then moving again. Okay, so we're taking it step by step. Okay, so you see we've already got um, two sides of the triangle. We're making good progress. And after that comes moving and turning and moving and turning and moving. Okay, but let's run that. Oops. Okay, so we've made a mistake um, in this case with, with the code. 
Um, I think we might actually, we, we move, we turn 120, we move, we turn, how much? Any suggestions how much we should turn? Might take a bit, it's 120. How does that look? Yep, but still too short. So we need to move 50 steps instead of 20 in order to get. Yep, thanks, Jason. Good on you. Got it there. Thank you. Um, completed. Um, so we've got our triangle. Okay. Good. And and at that point, we already. So we, you see, we are still in the first module. We just the students have just had a few activities, but at this point, we're already um, introducing students to the concept of a loop. Um, we were debating whether that would be too early, but we felt, well, the code just gets too complicated otherwise if we don't introduce the loop. So that was the point of saying, okay, let's make that here. And we showed that the um, code is doing exactly the same thing, similar to what we had in the slides. Okay, and we do the same thing with, um, with the loop. Now, there's one thing I would like to point out. You see this block code here, it just has five blocks. We move, we turn, we move, we turn, and we move. And that is all we need to make a triangle, okay? But when we put this code of moving and turning inside the, um, the repeat block, there is one additional left, turn left 120 degrees that gets executed at the end. So you see this one here, this turtle points to the right, whereas this point to the bottom left, okay? So that's important to be aware of because by by doing loops, we sometimes have an extra step, sometimes a step that we don't want. And in the case of the turtle, as I had to learn painfully, um, having uh, keeping track of the orientation of the turtle can, can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. So because if you now take the next step from here and do something else, um, your turtle might point into the wrong direction and you need to turn it back um, with, an, with an additional block sometimes. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, so we um, then do the repeat block to make our life easier. So what have we got here? Um, let me just reset the code. No, no, not doing that. Okay. So write a program to draw a triangle. Use the repeat block to buy, make life easier. Okay, so we want the triangle to be 50 steps long. Got that. And I've got here four, because I think uh, that's what I did yesterday when I set up the slides. Okay. So if I want a bigger triangle, very nice. I can just make it like this. Okay. Okay, then very important, um, students love color. So we are introducing them to the fill block and that then yields us a green triangle, which is here. And interestingly, the turtle also turns green. Well, it should be, it's a turtle, isn't it? Okay, and then the students do that and, and so on and so forth. So let me just walk you through a little bit because we're almost at the end of this webinar is, um, so in the first module, we get students to master to draw a triangle, initially just step by step with move and turn blocks, and then through a loop. So at the end of the first module, the students can draw a triangle and fill it with color. Okay, first success, wonderful. And um, in, in the second module, we then um, make preparations because the triangle needs to be turned a little bit. It's not yet in, in the right orientation. So we turn the triangle um, and then we grow it. And then we learn how to move the turtle. So sometimes a bit fiddly, as I mentioned earlier, the turtle ends up in places where we don't want it to be in order to draw the next step. We need to move it a little bit. Okay, and then we do the same thing. And, and that's the nice thing here about our computational thinking. So first we have mastered to do one triangle, now we do two triangle. So again, we are repeating ourselves and the students will then hopefully say, oh, I've seen, I've seen that pattern before. Okay, so um, we say, how can we make that easier? Okay, say, so, oh, right, we can put that into another loop. Okay, and this way we can draw three elements of our little tree. Okay, and we're also showing here the, um, Python code down here, by the way, in case the students are interested. 
And, and then we say, okay, if we can do three, that's not stopping. How about we do five? Okay, so what the point we want to make here is with, with very little additional effort, really just changing this three to five that code runs, is, is we're getting a wonderful new outcome. And I can do 10 if I like. And I do not need to add any additional block. I just need to change that number. Okay, I might write, run out of the canvas, but I've got 10, 10 segments to my tree. Okay, and that's kind of the, the key message we want to leave the students with. Okay, once you've mastered the loops, you can do all these amazing things. You can put loops into loops. And, and if you now go back and perhaps do with the students an activity, okay, if we didn't have the loops, what are the individual blocks that we would have had to um, put down here manually? I think the students will, will very, very quickly see um, the benefits of having the loops. All right, mm -hmm. just a bit of a, uh, we then shape the tree so that it becomes a bit slimmer at the top and wider at the bottom. And then we draw the stem and we learn um, pen up and down because at some point we start cutting through mm -hmm. a um, tree, which we don't want. And then at the end, we decorate our tree. Yeah. And then yeah. we add beautiful things like big and small baubles. Um, we have baubles with user input. Okay, so I think all these wonderful things. I've got a little bit of an if block. So this this tree activity kind of brings everything together from these two um, uh, webinars. Um, last time when we heard about the the angles, the the decisions, moving, turning, and here now with the loops, and we thought that would be a nice thing for the students in order to um, build something that they hopefully like and they can identify with. So that's an activity you can do with your students over a period of several weeks and students can, can work self-directed at their own pace. Uh, sorry, uh, the decorating part, it's all done through code as well? Yep, all, all done through code as well, Jason, yes. How do you make a circle with the turtle constant? Ah, let me demonstrate. Draw a circle here. We're drawing a circle. Voila. Oops. Let's go ahead. Aha. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I do remember how horrified my math teacher was when he asked the class, I think it was in year seven, said, what is a circle? And he wanted to hear the definition of a circle, of course. In mathematics, is the set of all points that have a given distance from, from another point, which is called the center of the circle. I said, no, just 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 draw an, an, a shape that has an infinite number of, of lines, and eventually you get something that resembles a circle. He didn't like that very much, but that's how computer scientists think. Okay, so we've got a little repeat block, which repeats in this case 36 times, which means we get 10 degree angles, and then we move forward and uh, turn right. I like it. I think this is another thing that's quite fun to explore with kids and have them keep trying different combinations of turns and see at what point their eyes start to think it's a circle. Fine. And I think they, um, if we draw this one, they wouldn't be able to tell that it's actually been done this way. Okay, mm. it looks like a perfect That's... circle to me. And we can play with that. So, for example, if I do only, let's say, 18 steps, but oh, let's say, let, let's not change the degrees. That would be funny. We should get half a circle, right? And if we do it 20 degrees. And of course, we get the full circle. And at some point, we will see the edges, especially if I make it bigger. So let's say I make it 10 steps forward. Okay, here we see now how the computer works, how it's actually an approximation of a circle only. But repeat it often enough and bring down the degrees and we'll look just fine. So now. Okay, yeah, all done by code, Jason, yeah. So um, just wanted to leave you with um, how you sign up your students, if you haven't done that already. Nicola, is, uh, is that something you would like to take uh, to cover? Um, I think we've covered this in previous I've weeks, but okay. uh, certainly um, once you have an account on Grok Learning, you can click on the teacher dashboard, um, and that's the place you can go to um, import your students, and depending on uh, what type of school you're at and whether you've migrated to the new email system, uh, the single sign-on can work for you to get your students signed up.
Um, but Jason, you can always drop us an email, help at aca.edu.au if you have specific questions to get students signed up. Um, more information about unpacking the curriculum you find on our aca.edu.au slash curriculum or unpacking website. Um, and there you will find also all the information about loops from this webinar. And, um, and then visit our resource page where you can um, uh, try out all these wonderful activities. And uh, down here is actually a little filter. You can choose um, Python, Blockly, Turtle, Microbit, and so on, and all sorts of combinations of, uh, of these um, keys. And um, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you.